USS Lexington was a mighty aircraft carrier from the US Navy that helped turn the tide of the naval war against the Japanese Empire during World War II. One of the largest and fastest ships of its day, it was initially designed as a battle cruiser, but it was then reclassified and affectionately nicknamed Lady Lex. After the unexpected attack on Pearl Harbor, Lexington was sent to the Coral Sea to halt the Japanese advances in the area. The ensuing Battle of the Coral Sea in May of 1942 would become the first carrier battle in history in which the opposing forces never came within sight of each other. Still, the Americans inflicted so much damage upon the Japanese fleet that they would not be able to stand up to them in the forthcoming Battle of Midway. Lexington's sacrifice would prove a watershed moment in naval history. Lady Lex USS Lexington was laid down in January of 1921. It was initially designed as a battlecruiser, but after the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922 that prohibited the construction of new battleships and battlecruisers, Lexington and its sister ship, Saratoga, were reclassified. The two Lexington-class ships would now serve as aircraft carriers. Rear Admiral William A. Moffat, chief of the Navy's new Bureau of Aeronautics, said of the new carrier, quote, This great carrier represents a powerful instrument on the offensive. I'm convinced that the bombing attack launched from such carriers, from an unknown point at an unknown instant with an unknown objective, could not be warded off by defensive aircraft based on shore. Lexington was launched in 1925. The ship was 888 feet long, its top speed reached 35 knots, and it had a propulsion system that included four sets of turboelectric drive. It once sailed 2,200 miles from San Pedro, California to Honolulu, Hawaii in just over 72 hours. Lexington had a basic complement of 2,200 men and carried tubs of rapid-fire guns and a main battery of 8-inch rifles. This armament would later be replaced to accommodate 23 Wildcat fighters, 36 Dauntless dive bombers, and 12 Devastator torpedo bombers. The imposing vessel was commissioned on December 14, 1927, and received the nickname of Lady Lex. It entered service a year later and was assigned to the Pacific Fleet. From 1930 to 1932, the ship was commanded by naval aviator Ernest J. King, who would become the five-star chief of naval operations in World War II. During a drought that lasted several months in 1929 and 1930, Lexington supplemented the electrical supply of the city of Tacoma, Washington. She then helped deliver supplies to Managua in Nicaragua after the devastating 1931 earthquake. And the carrier even had a crucial role in the massive two-week search operation to find Amelia Earhart in 1937. Both Lexington and Saratoga eventually helped to plan and refine carrier strategies before World War II broke out. And in an ominous twist of fate, these tactics included staging surprise attacks on Pearl Harbor. The war begins. From 1940 onward, Lexington was commanded by Captain Frederick C. Ted Sherman, a skillful submarine veteran from World War I and Navy crossholder. At the time of the Pearl Harbor attack on December 7, 1941, Lexington was ferrying a squadron of Vought SB-2U Vindicator dive bombers to Midway Island. The mission was cancelled when the carrier was still 400 miles southeast of Midway, and she then turned around to look for Japanese carriers along the south of Oahu. A few days later, Lexington returned to Pearl Harbor for refueling. On December 14th, Lexington joined Task Force 11 under the command of Vice Admiral Wilson Brown Jr. The fleet consisted of three heavy cruisers, nine destroyers, and one oiler tank. Their mission was to divert the Japanese forces en route to the besieged Wake Island by creating a diversion in the Marshall Islands. But the attack was cancelled on December 20th, and the Japanese captured Wake Island three days later, before the relief efforts got there. The following month, Lexington was sent to the Coral Sea to block Japanese advances in the area. Several American, British, and Australian vessels would join forces to attack a major Japanese naval base in Rabaul, New Britain. However, they were soon spotted by flying boats, and Brown attempted to cancel the raid, but it was too late. Land-based Nakajima B-5M Kate and Mitsubishi G-4M Betty torpedo bombers charged against the fleet, while the Americans responded with Grumman F-4F Wildcats and Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bombers. Lieutenant Edward H. O'Hare intercepted a formation of nine Japanese bombers and shot down five Bettys in four minutes. He became the Navy's first flying ace and the first naval recipient of the Medal of Honor in World War II for these actions. He also received 5,000 cigarettes from workers at Grumman Aircraft Corporation. The Pacific Situation The Allies were in a dire predicament. The Japanese had seized Wake, 
Guam, and several smaller islands, and had taken over British bases in Singapore and Hong Kong. They had also attacked Malaya, the Philippines, the Dutch Indies, the Gilbert Islands, Shanghai, Borneo, and Burma. In early 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt told Prime Minister Winston Churchill, quote, The Pacific situation is very grave. On April 18th, American codebreakers found out about the Japanese Operation Mo that would be launched on May 3rd. The objective was to capture Tulagi in the Solomons, then Rabaul, and finally Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea. The Japanese strategies usually relied on a passive enemy that wouldn't cause too much trouble, and they were overconfident about their forces. Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto expressed that the Japanese were gripped by, quote, the victory disease, while British Captain Basil Liddell Hart described the Japanese maneuvers as a, quote, strategic overstretch. The Japanese forces' ultimate goal was to be able to execute land-based attacks on northern Australia. If they controlled New Guinea, the Japanese could also reach the islands of New Caledonia, Fiji, and Samoa from there. This would then halt communications and supply lines between Australia and the U.S., potentially forcing Australia to surrender. Out of the five aircraft carriers that the Americans had deployed to the Pacific, only Yorktown and Lexington were capable of facing the Japanese threat. Battle of the Coral Sea Japanese forces invaded Tulagi on May 3rd, as British and Australian troops had already evacuated the island before the enemy got there. But the next day, the Americans caught the invaders by surprise with a full-on aircraft carrier task force attack, destroying several Japanese ships and aircraft. Still, the damage wasn't enough to hinder the Japanese from building a seaplane base on the island. Meanwhile, Yorktown and Lexington sailed west to the Jamard Passage near Port Moresby to face Japan's combined fleet, but they couldn't find them as the enemy was miles away surrounding the Solomons. Both fleets stalked each other for two days, with poor weather conditions leading to several mistakes and missed opportunities. On May 7th, Japanese aircraft spotted the USS Neosho Euler and the USS Sims destroyer and mistook them as carriers. Their strikes sank the destroyer and heavily damaged the fleet oiler. Meanwhile, Lexington's air group launched bombs and torpedoes against the Japanese light carrier Shoho, believing it to be a fleet carrier. The Japanese ship was sunk a short distance from Mishima Island. The next morning, both fleets were unsuspectedly close, and engagement became inevitable. The American Dauntlesses and Devastators scored first against the Japanese carriers. Zuikaku managed to hide under the clouds, but Shokaku was out in the open. Lieutenant John J. Powers, piloting one of the bombers, had vowed, quote, to get a hit if I have to lay it on their flight deck. And he fulfilled that promise. Powers dropped one of three bombs that forced Shokaku to withdraw, but he was caught up in the explosion. He would eventually be awarded a posthumous Medal of Honor. Meanwhile, a Japanese raid of 69 aircraft was detected by Lexington radars. The Navy immediately sent nine Wildcats to intercept them, but they were flying too low and saw the Japanese aircraft pass them over. A coordinated strike from the Japanese torpedo and bombing squadrons ultimately proved tactically superior to the Americans, and the vast majority of their aircraft concentrated on Lexington. The American carrier dodged the attacks for a while, but it was eventually hit on its port side by two torpedoes. Two divers also scored hits against the vessel, but they caused minor damage. The damaged carrier could still conduct flight operations and keep moving at 24 knots. Lexington kept sending and receiving aircraft when an explosion triggered by sparks that ignited gasoline vapors briefly halted operations. Another blast two hours later wrecked the water presser and steering control systems. And a series of explosions in the following hours finally put a final blow on the colossal carrier. Captain Sherman reluctantly ordered to abandon ship at 5.07 p.m., and around 2,770 surviving crew members were evacuated. Over 200 men had lost their lives, but no wounded men were left behind. Legacy The task force then regrouped and withdrew to the south. Lexington was scuttled to prevent exposing it to the enemy, and between 7.15 and 7.52 p.m., five torpedoes from the destroyer Phelps sank the ship for good. An officer exclaimed, quote, There she goes. She didn't turn over. She's going down with her head up. Dear old Lux, a lady to the last. Although the battle was a victory for the Japanese in terms of ships sunk, it would prove a strategic victory for the Allies. Lady Lex's sacrifice would cost the Japanese two carriers that required repairs and were not ready to fight in the Battle of Midway a month later, a conflict that would prove the downfall of the Japanese Empire. Thanks for watching my video.
please like it and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels for more historical stories. And let us know in the comments below if you'd like us to cover a specific tale.